Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to True Potential Do More With Your Money podcast 54 on Friday, the 4th of February. I'm joined this morning by three of the investment management team. We have Jeff Casson, Chief Investment Officer, George Bell, Analyst, and Chris Leyland, Director of Investment Strategy. So, well, good morning, everybody. Um, Jeff, before we get into what's happened to the markets this week, I'm just keen to know whether there's been any homeschooling flashpoints at your place this week. <laughs> well, there's been a few, shall we say, when the, the old internet seems to be falling over at times. So there's been a few things that have, have come to the fore this week and we've had we've had the, a few few visitors when we've been on various different calls as well at times. So yeah, it's been an interesting week for that. Do you think we'll get a visit today, Jeff? There's there's a distinct possibility that that may occur. <laughs> oh, good, good. Special guest, either Rory guest or appearance. Charlie. <laughs> Everyone, keep your fingers crossed for Jeff's internet connection through this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> George, I was thinking the other day. You know that, that we, we've been in lockdown for for so long. I mean, for us where we live, it was 16th of September um, when when we were put in the, into one of the higher tiers. Um, I know you've been active and you've, you get yourself out and you've had one or two slips, George, um, standing <laughs> in things that you'd rather not have stood in when you're out running. Um, but I, I was keen to know, George, what has been your best lockdown purchase? My best lockdown purchase? Um, you've put us on the spot there. I'm trying to think of all the incredibly boring things that I've bought, such as thicker woolen, woolen jumpers and thicker woolen socks to keep us warm in this <laughs> And a better internet connection. <laughs> so it's not me <laughs> we missed that, George. You froze. So, Mark, I was saying best lockdown purchase is probably a coffee machine. Ah, good so one. I can, have a, I can have a posh coffee in the morning. Ah, very good. And Chris thinks he's going to get the same questions because I saw him look when I asked you that, George. His <laughs> eyes went up like that where he's visualizing it. Chris, what was your worst lockdown purchase? Um, probably my worst lockdown purchase was I actually bought some kind of new smart clothes in the sale in what would have been May time with the expectation that we were going back to work. So I bought two new pairs of shoes for work and another smart pair of shoes for myself um, the work shoes have never, ever been worn. The smart shoes have probably been worn about twice. I should have just bought loads of dry fit tracksuit bottoms and shorts. That would have been perfect. <laughs> <laughs> to go with your shell suit collection, Chris. <laughs> yeah, and my curly wig and my moustache. <laughs> I've left my curly wig off today, unfortunately. <laughs> I think... By special request, I know that, the, you know, what we have today on the podcast is we've got questions that the, the viewers have sent in. And I think there might be a request coming in, Chris, for you to wear a curly wig at one of the future, <laughs> future podcasts. <laughs> we'll keep that one in the future, I think. <laughs> I don't know if you'd get the headset over the wig. <laughs> the, headset, the headset doesn't fit over my head. So <laughs> no, never mind the wig. <laughs> That's so is new that, one, is it not? It is. It's it's brand new. Um, I did a presentation yesterday, and I couldn't work out if they were sort of making a joke or they just went, "You you look like you work for NASA." But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, responsibility is looking after all the clients' assets as as getting a space rocket up in the air. So it's a very <laughs> apt thing to say. <laughs> If it if it doesn't fit, Chris, it could well be your worst lockdown purchase. We'll see if it slips during the course of the um, this morning's event. Yeah, that's yeah even worse than the shoes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> put your shoes on your head and your headphones on your feet, Chris. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, as I mentioned before, we've got some questions that have come in from, from viewers. But before we do that, Jeff, um, let's have a look at the markets, what's happened this week and the, the key points that we'd like to pick out for everyone. Yeah, I suppose it's, it's been a week of, of really interesting market developments, both if we look at equities, bonds and even on the economic front. So lots of, of things to go. But I suppose I'd maybe start it by saying what a difference a week makes. 
um, from where we ended um, last week into the, the the quarter end, or sorry, the month end, um, versus where we've ended up um, over the first first week of February. So, really, if you look at MSCI World over the the course of the week, we're probably up about 2.3, 2.4% in sterling terms, and that gets us back into to a better position on a on a full year basis so far with equity markets globally up about 2.6%. So big change from where we were last week. I suppose what, what happened, a lot of the, the issues that were at the front and the fore around the equity market in particular um, receded quite significantly towards um, the end of last week and then definitely at the beginning of this week. And by that, I mean GameStop, AMC Entertainment, the associated impacts of that. And we'll probably come on and discuss that because there's a, there's a few questions out there around that. So I'll not go into that in, in detail here, but really looking at it and bringing it down to some of the, the regional equity markets, looking what we saw there, very much a thesis of sort of the reopening and the, the reflationary story playing out with, in the US in particular, we look at the Russell 2000, so that index of smaller uh, companies, that was up 4.6% on the week. Um, NASDAQ up close to 4% and S&P up well over 2.5%. So strong performance coming through from the US. And I think really there, looking at it on a sector basis is, is quite instructive as well, because we did see some quite interesting moves within that in terms of the energy sector continuing to be strong. It's one of the strongest performing areas year to date, up some 10%, as you know, we've touched in the morning markets, what's been happening in the oil price. That's really feeding through there but also financials and then even the, the, the communication services sector, which captures some of the, the technology names, which have, have reported really strong results. And that's fed into to really good performance from those, those equities over the, the course of this week. So that, that's been very supportive in the US. Looking then around other regions, it's, it's very, it's a slightly different picture, more of a mixed picture. Emerging markets there, again, a better performance, continuing to build on what we've seen over the course of the year, again, speaking to that um, cyclical improvement, the reflation story, benefiting the manufacturing uh, sector within emerging markets. Europe, um, probably up about a percent over the course of the week. But again, that's quite mixed. Uh, if we look at a country level, some quite interesting divergences there. And we can maybe come on and, and touch on Italy and, and what's happened there in terms of the political backdrop, but then a, a central banker. Uh, coming in to, to form the coalition. Um, if you look at the UK, really interesting performance in the UK, um, divergence between the, the large cap FTSE 100 versus what we've seen in the, the more domestic orientated mid and small cap with FTSE 100 actually down over the course of the week, but um, small in the FTSE 250 up over 2%. So again, feeding into that economic uh, backdrop that we've, we've been touching on. Um, just one of the things that we've we've tended to discuss and people have asked about is just the performance of of value and versus growth and really it's been a a week of of growth being to the fore and i think over the course of the year to date growth has continued to to, to pick up some of that leadership from value but interestingly we're seeing that both sides of it improve at the minute so there does appear to be a bit of a broadening out in terms of, of performance which is a real positive turning to to bonds and what we've seen there Really, it's back to that story of inflation expectations picking up a little bit. And we've seen sovereign bonds, the yields move out, so the prices come off ever so slightly there. And that, I suppose, is, is to be expected, given the economic data that we're seeing that, that points to a little bit of, of improvement. Um, if we think about vaccines in particular and the support that that could, could bring over the, the coming months. I think the other thing there, just to, to really touch on in, in bond markets, and it speaks back to the performance of, of financials in, in the equity market is we've seen a steepening of the yield curve. Um, so by that, we mean that the difference between, say, a 10 year and 30 year, it's just get that bit steeper. And that's a real positive for, for financials, given their, their business models. And that's kind of also fed through then into to investment grade, the sort of the higher risk areas of, of the IG market being the areas that have performed well such as high yield. And then if we look at emerging market debt as well, that's that's done well over the course of the week. Um, and just maybe a couple of other points to, to touch on, um, just looking at some of the economic data that we've seen this time of the month, you get a lot of the, the PMI, so purchasing managers indices, they're forward looking 
indicators. We've had those for both manufacturing and predominantly services um, laterally in this week. And really a, a story of very different geographies there. We've seen the UK, we've seen Europe, the service sector, we've seen it retrench a little bit in terms of the numbers. But then we compare that with the US and we've seen an improvement in the services sector, so an acceleration there. And it just really has got us as a as a team sort of thinking about the differences within the, the geographies and whether that could allow sort of the US to you know accelerate maybe faster than people had expected, but also relative to to Europe as well. So that's something that that we're continuing to to monitor. The other, I think, key thing that feeds back to to bond markets in all of this has been the the input costs that the surveys are highlighting. So cost pressures coming in and that feeding its way into to sort of inflation expectations again, linking back to to the bond market. Finally, I maybe just mentioned very briefly, and we'll come on and discuss this probably later because there's a question around the Bank of England. But I think the the detail that they put out yesterday in the the the, the report um, with their interest rate decision is really quite interesting, quite instructive for for the UK economy, uh, but also for how they're thinking about policy as well. So I'll maybe leave it there, a bit of a whistle stop tour of what's happening, but. As always, lots happening, lots for us to think about, lots for our, our managers to be considering and, and thinking about how it influences the positioning of the, the true potential portfolio proposition. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. There, ha there has been a lot going on this week. And I, I want to bring George in in just a second to talk about the, the Bank of England and the, the report that, that came out um, a couple of days ago. But first of all, though, Chris, we've heard from Jeff there. We've heard what's happened in the markets. Um, this is feeding through into the portfolios, of course. Um, can you can you just give give everybody an idea of, of how the the events that Jeff's highlighted there have affected the values of the portfolios? Yeah, sure. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, when we look at the portfolios over the week, um, I'm actually really pleased to say that you've seen a good uplift in portfolio performance overall. So if we were to take, say, the aggressive portfolio, that was up just over 1.2% over the week. So what you've seen there is a good uplift. If we take, say, our balanced portfolio, uh, obviously that's a little bit lower risk compared to the aggressive portfolio, but that was up just under 0.8%. So again, um, what you've seen in some ways is a reversal of what Jeff was talking about, you know, things like the the GameStop effect, um, and what you've seen is investors become more confident overall this week, and with that, that's really fed into portfolio performance. So for me, um, very pleased with with how the month started actually in respect of the portfolios. Yeah, good, good, and it, you know, all portfolios are showing good gains over the course of 2021, which is which is great for, for everybody who's invested in them. Uh, George, Bank of England, I know that you 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 had your your head in the pages over the last couple of days to see what's been said. And you, you sent a note around everybody within two potential this morning and um, it would probably form part of the, the morning market update as well. So can you can you just tell everybody what you the points, the main points you, you saw? Um, in the announcements? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, central bank policy is of, of key focus because of the, the huge positive effect which it's had on, on markets uh, since since March 2020, effectively. So a lot of attention was leading up to this. So a couple of points which were which were, were cleared off. Uh, they maintained base rate at 0.1%. They also maintained their bond purchase program target at £895 billion. Pounds. So that includes the 150 billion, which was announced in November. So that additional stimulus support. So that takes the current, um, in terms of where they're at, in terms of that target, uh, they're at about 759 billion now. So still a way to go. Um, so still some some armory left in that toolkit there. But just highlights just how 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 quickly the the Bank of England has acted. The Monetary Policy Committee have, have, have uplifted that support package overall. They also um, work to to reduce the, the the focus which was on negative interest rates so they effectively in the dialogue took that off the table for for the short term so 
what one of the things which they were mentioning in the minute was that you know sending a signal to that they intended to take base rates negative was not their intention but given negative rates are within the toolkit it would be appropriate to start the preparations to provide the capability to use them if so so it was it was prudent management it's in the toolbox they need to make sure that banks would be um, able to to manage on that basis and that really sort of ran alongside the pra's a survey which highlighted some of the operational challenges which negative rates could bring to banks, not only in terms of their business model, but also in terms of the infrastructure, their systems, and how that would actually work in practice. Um, so just highlighting that the banks would need sufficient time to prepare. I think an, another thing which the, the minutes drew out, which was interesting, was yes, they acknowledged the difficulties which we would face in the first quarter of 2021. We're back in a, a national lockdown um, and that has to be factored in. But really looking forward into the second half of, of the year, increased optimism for, for economic growth coming through there. So the things which were support in this were expectations of increased activity levels, increased expectations of spending, given where saving rates are, demand, um, all as the vaccination program continues to run out. And we've seen from the data, you know, the success of, of the UK relative to a number of the European peers, relative to a number of, of, of countries worldwide, if you look at, often quoted as per 100,000 people, you know, we're right up there in terms of the, the proportion of, of people who have received the vaccine. I saw a, a print, and this is a, a global um, stat, but it was just sort of highlighting you know, just how fast the vaccination program has started to accelerate. And there's more people being vaccinated than confirmed cases out there at the moment, which is <clears throat> when you think about all of the information which you've got at the moment, in terms of getting an idea of acceleration, for me, that quite neatly, neatly drew together the two sides. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of focus on, on the Bank of England yesterday, the Monetary Policy Committee decision. To Jeff's point, you know, the reaction from Bond markets was probably where where the, where the where it was most felt. You had yields on the 10-year, which backed up around 6.8 basis points. You had the yield there on a 10-year government bond at 0.44%. You had the 30-year up 7.5 basis points. So yield of a 30-year government bond, just over 1% there. And sterling, sterling appreciated against the euro. I'll say the euro because there was a, um, you know, relative to the dollar, you had um, activity within the dollar. On the day, but against the euro, you had still in at, at about 114, which is levels we last saw around May last year. So, uh, you know, an interesting reaction from from the markets. I think it just sort of drew to to, to the fore um, how many participants were expecting negative rates to be a possibility in the near term, um, a situation which the, the monetary policy committee are trying to manage to their communication very carefully. I think it was also interesting just to see the reaction across even the. The really short duration bonds as well, where most of those have been negative yielding um, over the, the the course of the past number of months, and I think most of those moved to to positive yielding on the on the back of the announcement. So interesting, as George just says there, that, that you know, clearly some market participants were expecting the bank maybe to push things a bit a bit more um, going forward. But the as as George is highlighting there, the the communication has been. I think they've done really well because there's been this sort of split within the the, the MPC between the, the the sort of the Bank of England members versus the external members about how they may or may not want to to use the the negative policy rates and they seem to have navigated that quite well in in this statement and setting out both the views of those that are for it those that are against it the potential signaling mechanisms that that, that go with it. And then how ultimately they they are are thinking about. So I think you know we have to give them a bit of credit for for communicating it in in the way that they have. I think they also take on board a little bit of what the the commercial banks have been saying because they do reference the potential to have a dual a dual interest rate structure going forward, very similar to the approach that the ECB takes, which you know could help banks deal with it if this was something that. The, the Bank of England ever thought was was going to be part of their their policy toolkit, and it also comes in the back of a week where the Reserve Bank in Australia gave very good forward guidance as well. So, one of the key things that we know about markets is at this point in time is that the communication of central banks, the communication of Treasury ministers is is crucial, and there's been I think two good examples this week of very clear 
communication um, from from central banks with important messages um, for the market in terms of rates in the UK, but also the the dynamics that they would be looking at both in Australia and in the UK for for policy rates to move higher. And Jeff, let, let, let's look ahead. Let, the, the possibility of negative interest rates seems to have gone for now. But to to uh, people who've got money in a bank and a deposit account, what would it actually mean to them? Yeah, so I think there's, and that's a, a really interesting and sort of philosophical debate that we would, we all have to think about. And I think why banks, in terms of their response to the PRA, really highlighted the challenges. They're, 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 as they say in, in the in the, the notes, um, their their core banking systems don't allow them to cope with negative rates. It was never something that was envisaged when, uh, you know, the, the the banking software was developed and set up. So there, there's a massive operational headache for them. So I suppose you know the the the, the clear implication of it may be for for us as consumers that well we maybe get charged for the the privilege of having our money deposited. In, in a bank, although that is, is maybe less likely and more likely is that we all end up having to pay at some level for our, our consumer uh, checking account. So there's a fee attached um, to, 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 to being able to bank. We're very much used to not having that in the UK. That would be one way for banks to try and deal with the, the challenge that, that negative rates could, could present if it was something that came down to be used in the future. Um, but it, it, it presents an interesting challenge. You know, I think philosophically you have to debate whether it's been a success. You know, can we argue that having negative rates from the ECB at, at minus like 0.5%, if that's been a success or not, has it stimulated growth? Has it stimulated inflation? On, on the evidence today, we'd have to say not really. So I think that there is that sort of philosophical discussion that needs to be had as well in terms of the, the transmission mechanism? Does it make people do more, um, i.e. banks lend more? Yeah. I'm not yet convinced. Um, I'm, I must admit, I sort of side more with the the internal members of the, the MPC and, and their view versus some of the, the external members at this point in time. I was just going to say we can look elsewhere for, for reference there. You know, we, Japan, Europe, you know, negative rates have been a feature for some time now. Um, so, you know, we, we, we can use use the success or, or, or challenges which it's brought to, to certain regions to, to gauge the impact there. I think just kind of reversing back a little bit and you, know, you were talking about what could it mean for the end client. Um, we do a lot of work with a Swiss bank, UBS, and they were talking about if you have deposits north of 500,000 Swiss francs, then you actually get charged on that. So it does give you an idea of you know, that traditional idea of, OK, I put money in the bank and then I get interest on that money. You know, it, all what is happening in the current environment around either very low rates or negative rates, it just completely challenges that view of cash and a return on cash. And I think for me, the, the key thing that comes out of it is, you know, in some ways there's no free lunch. The reality is investors do need to take some kind of risk to get inflation beating returns overall. And for me, you know, is that going to go away in the next couple of years? It doesn't feel like that at all. You know, I think we're going to be in a, a low interest rate environment for some time now. So investors really need to think about ways to to maximise that return. And for me, that that's got to be investing it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Chris. And it, it's a message that we've been saying for a long, long time, particularly with interest rates being as they are. You know, at all time lows, if it if it does go to negative, cash starts to uh, cost and. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's going to be a need for cash for day-to-day -day expenditure for the emergency fund, but as a, a medium to longer term investment vehicle, it has no use whatsoever. Yeah. Um, Jeff, in your, your summary, you mentioned Mario Draghi's got himself a new job. Um, I, I'm moving from the UK into Europe and then I'm heading to the US if you're wondering where <laughs> I'm off to. But uh, let's stop off in Italy for a short time. I know, Chris, you, you particularly like holidays in Italy, um, but that's, <laughs> that's another story that perhaps we'll, we'll keep for the outtakes. Uh, but uh, a new job for Mr Draghi. 
Yeah, certainly he's, he's, he's certainly um, taken up a bigger challenge, one could argue probably, in trying to corral Italian politics together. But we touched on, I think, over the past couple of weeks, just some of the, the, the challenges that Giuseppe Conte was experiencing from a, a coalition perspective. And I think he, he probably threw the card and thought, well, I'll, I'll have one last gamble at trying to to reform the coalition. And that seems to have failed. And the, the president has now asked uh, a career central banker um, to, to step into the role. And you know, we discussed this as a, as a team yesterday. And it's an interesting development in the sense that you've got Janet Yellen as, as Treasury Secretary in the US, ex-head of the FOMC, the Federal Reserve. You've now got somebody in a very similar position, potentially in even more powerful position in, in trying to assemble a coalition in Italy. I must admit, I don't envy his task. Um, Italian politics is is fraught with, with difficulty. But I think at this point in time, they do have to find a way to, to get a coalition to work because um, elections in the midst of COVID-19 and where we are just does not seem that something that would be at all helpful. It's interesting, I think, the other side of it to look at Italian sort of um, economic numbers that we've seen. Come, it's as if the, the, the population have tried to sort of disconnect themselves from, from the politics. And you've seen better manufacturing and better services data coming out of Italy. So just showing that, you know, as much as we all think politics matters, what really matters is what's happening on the ground, what businesses are doing and what people are doing. And it looks as if they are just going about their business we're a bit like the market to an extent, putting this in the background and saying, look, it's a risk. We can see it. Um, and it's been probably received positively, I think, looking at bond markets. So this morning, Italy's probably one of the very few that I can see where yields have come in over the course of, of the week. So it gives you a sense that some of that political uncertainty has been, been taken out of the equation a little bit. Um, he managed to corral the, the ECB into moving with some very um, sort of astute policy changes uh, through a number of crises. So if anybody can negotiate, I think it's Mario Draghi. Um, yeah. But I, get, I, I don't envy his task. No. I read a fascinating article last year that suggested that Italy could bring down the EU. You know, the, it, it was in the, the middle of all the Brexit hype that was going on here. It, it, it was a very well, well written article saying, look, this, this, the UK leaving might not be, you know, what yeah. brings it down. But if Italy was to go, that that could be cataclysmic as far as the anybody who who is a supporter of the EU. So perhaps there's a, there's a lot to be said for the appointment there. Um, and just to, to maybe expand on that a, a, a little bit, and I suppose that's why the the ECB policies this year or last year and this year have been important. Um, in terms of buying up peripheral debt and stopping, or at least stopping is too harsh a word, but managing how yields have evolved within sort of the, the periphery and why the, the EU recovery fund and the, the, the need for um, centralised debt issuance is very important because it takes away um, from the, the, the EU that risk of a country being problematic because you're funding off the the EU's balance sheet as a as a as a yeah. block. Sorry, oh, George, I interrupted you. Go on, go on you go yeah, I'm just going to say there's there's good good reason for you bringing up um, you know Janet Yellen in the US and 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 drawing together the relationship with what you're seeing with Mar Mario Draghi there. One of the key strengths of of policy through 2020 was really that collaborative approach between government and central banks. Um, that's not only when you put in money in it's also into the next stages as well and how you think about potentially tapering policy back in the in the future so having that collaboration and um, strengthening that i think that will be something which will be very important i think just i was looking down at my phone then so i was just looking something up to get the exact number but um since world war ii italy has had 66 governments so one on average every one spot one four years so it gives you an idea of the strength of the italian political system overall when you have such significant change all the time and it also maybe gives you an idea of what a potentially tough job it's going to be for mario draghi overall i think that's interesting chris because if you look through that 
Italy is the, the second largest manufacturing nation in the EU behind Germany. So it shows that, that the Italian um, business can look through the politics and get on and, 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 and actually do very well. Okay, should we move across to the US? Um, we, we haven't heard too much about what's happening. Joe Biden seems to be just getting on with things very quietly. Um, we've had some, some um, US non-farm payroll data come through, um, which was quite encouraging, George. Yeah, I think you know, there'll be a lot of focus on the labor market, um, you know, especially over the, over the coming weeks and months. We had the ADP report earlier in the week, which demonstrated that you know, the US um, jobs market improved better, more, than, more than analysts were expecting. Um, you know, I think there's 174,000 um, new jobs within the US in January relative to the expectation of 50,000. Um, so, you know, quite some difference there. So it's showing some signs of, of life on on the, the US jobs market. I think the thing to consider, though, is there's still around 10.7 million people in the US who are unemployed. So you've still got quite a bit of labor market slack um, as, as, as it's referred to. So I think, you know, Whilst we are seeing the, the positive signs of life within the labour market and even in the service sectors, as, as Jeff mentioned earlier, it still does keep in place the, the, the requirement or the, the potential to push through uh, the Democratic's 1.9 um, fiscal relief package, which uh, $1.9 trillion, um, which would be substantial. And it's it, it, again, there that, that would be there to support the labour market, would be to continue to support the economy. To the next stage of the recovery. Um, but yeah, encouraging data, which is coming through better than expected. And Jeff, you, you were mentioning before in the US market how, how, how the, the S&P, which is you know the, the, one of the major indices that everybody looks at, but had, had risen. But the Russell 2000, which looks at smaller companies, that had gone up by more. Yeah, yeah. So the Russell over the, the, the course of the week was up uh, close to, to four and a half four and a half, four point six percent over over the week, um, by two percent of a outperformance. But going back a little bit as well, that's kind of been a theme that we've been we've been seeing and we've we've had exposure to within the portfolios as well in terms of the small cap uh, theme being being relatively strong. And and why why I suppose is that it goes back to to November, the beginning of November, the, the vaccine news, the the, the 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 way that that potentially allows economic activity to recover, and, and smaller companies are those companies that are very much tied into domestic economies. As you go up the the market cap spectrum, you you start to have much more businesses that are internationally driven in terms of their their revenue profile. That's not what you you typically have in in the smaller companies, and it's a trend that we've seen. Um, across across different geographies, most pronounced in the US, where where the Russell has been exceptionally strong, but even looking in the UK at, at small cap, looking at Europe small cap, even emerging market small cap, these are all areas that have have done well over over the course of the last last three months. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, I, I I'd would like to get on to now to the, some of the questions that have been sent in by by people who've uh, watched the podcast. And again, everybody who's written to us, uh, thank you very much. There's been some common areas. So if if the questions don't exactly reflect the wording that you sent them in, we've brought them together, but the, the gist of the questions will be, will be the same. And Chris, I'm going to, to send the first one over to you, which is, which is really around COVID and how, how, how has COVID affected portfolio performance? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, I was listening to someone and they said, imagine if you disappeared to another planet at the end of 2019 and then you reappeared at the end of 2020. And what would you have seen? Well, you would have actually seen in general that asset prices were, were positive. And actually what you could have thought is, you know, what a, what a nice year 2020 was. But I think when you look underneath that, what you've seen is quite a big disparity in returns overall. So let's just get the, the headline figures out of the way. Um, if we look at, say, the true potential growth portfolio, that was up over 4% for 2020. So again, what you've seen is a good positive return from the portfolio overall. But what that doesn't really tell you is kind of what's happening under the bonnet. So if we look regionally and we look over 2020, 
Um, you've got a region such as China, which was up 34 percent. Obviously, China was sort of first in, first out in respect of COVID. And they did very well to control COVID and to reopen their economy at a fast pace. Obviously, we've seen China GDP figures come through for 2020 and they were positive. So you know, it's pretty incredible that they actually grew the economy during COVID times. Then you've got someone like the UK, which was actually down. So that was down around about 11 percent overall. Um, within that, you obviously, the UK market's quite exposed to areas such as energy, areas such as banks, which struggled over that period. And then maybe if you kind of build that into the sectors overall and how they've done, um, you've got huge disparity there. So you've got things such as energy. So energy was off 30% during 2020. So that's world equities energy. And then you've got something like tech, which was actually up 44 percent so you've got a 74 percent difference between those two sectors and what does that mean well it means that that disparity is good for active managers um, it means that active managers need to get it right um, and if you get it wrong then you'll be punished for getting it wrong um, but overall you know i'm pleased to say that the managers that that we have here at true potential have done well during those time periods. Um, so for me, in summary, um, a little bit of, I guess, of a roller coaster ride for 2020, but actually you know, we've ended up with a good positive return. If we then look at how that's moved into 2021, um, you know, as, as sort of Jeff was saying, and I know you said this as well, Mark, um, if we look to the end of this week, year to date, you know, we've got some good positive returns there. So um, again, you know, pleased with how things are going. And I think maybe more importantly is, you know, what we've seen is that shift in, in investor attitude. So a shift maybe away from you know, some of those stay at home stocks, which actually are still doing quite well, um, towards areas that are more geared into the global economy reopening. And all of that is basically factored into the fact that we have a vaccine now. So arguably we have a, a sort of an end point for COVID overall. Um, so for me, you know, positive on the outlook for 2021. I think also, Chris, you mentioned there that the growth portfolio is is up, you know, you said 4%. When you yeah. when you take the, the volatility in the market, you know, the, 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 there are points that you could have, that investors have come into the growth portfolio and they'll have seen close to a 30% return oh, yeah. because yeah. They, they, you know, Anybody who was investing from, say, February, March and April, the, the bounce has come through there. And what it's meant for me more than anything else, when you look at it, it's the rapid innovation that COVID's brought about in, in lots of different sectors. And pharmaceuticals has to be the one that, that, that stands out most because we've seen a vaccine not only developed, but also distributed and it's it's gone from vaccine to vaccination the you know the the, the the play on words that we've heard so often within a period of 12 months and it's it's continuing to roll out it's the distribution side now which seems to be slowing it down a little bit but you know the the headlines in the papers this morning I had a quick scan this morning we're talking about um, uh, restrictions being lifted in the UK perhaps around spring sporting event and meeting people outdoors coming back in and this is purely down to vaccinations um, being rolled out across the UK so uh, for me it's, it's been mostly the rapid innovation and you can see the way that we're working now we're all at home but the portfolios are functioning in exactly the same way that they did before there's been no disruption of service um, and other people can can say that as well whereas if you're in the, the travel industry or the leisure industry it's been a much, much different picture. But th there will be improvements in those areas as well. You know, when, when people are able to book hotels in the UK, they'll probably find that the, the more forward thinking of the, the hotel chains of, and the, the, the hotel operators have been able to revamp their services, revamp their, their, their rooms, and it'll be a different experience for those who are going in in, in spring and summer of, of 2021. It's interesting, isn't it, to think about that speed of innovation across 
you know, numerous sectors and you know we've we've got a piece coming out today that will look at sort of the role of of ai so uh, i encourage everybody to have a have a look at that but just to your very point mark on, on vaccines and you think about just the the rapid progress that, that technology has allowed to be technology has enabled that has enabled us to to profile uh, the the virus exceptionally quickly and you go back to the the first vaccine that was you know ever developed for, for for measles i think it was and it probably took them six or seven years to yeah. go from initial concept to to something that was acceptable is maybe too strong a word to use because it was still it's still been a hard um yards to get people to accept that that vaccine initially so you know that you know that that pulling in of of the time frame of development is is a fascinating thing for us for us all and probably speaks to continued innovation and rapid innovation that we'll we'll continue to see um going forward as well yeah yeah i think it's i was just gonna say i think it's quite interesting um you know we were jeff and i were talking last night about the the retail industry and i get the impression that maybe jeff's not the biggest fan of going the shops overall um, and one of the things that you were saying to me jeff was that um you know, you, you're not sure if how much you'll ever really be in a shop unless you need to be, because now you can get everything delivered. So, so you'll miss out on those Saturday afternoon shoppings that that, that I think you obviously clearly love. <laughs> I just think, I suppose what I, what we're, we're we're really discussing there is the the change in attitudes of people yeah. and how how people do things differently. I think you know, going back to to, to, to Mark's point there around travel leisure, I think people will definitely want to do that. Those are those their experiences, and maybe actually the use of technology to fulfil things that you know, maybe going shopping for food is not an experience, but actually going to a sports event, going to a hotel, that is an experience. And maybe what you you could see is a shift to how people consume certain things to enable them to be to be much more experience orientated. Um, just given you know the fact that people have had to psychologically sit in the house for for 12 months, um, I think you could see subtle shifts um, within that. I think we're definitely in first names with the Amazon driver and any other delivery driver that seems to be coming to the house. Um, yeah. But it's also generational. If if I think about the older generation as well, that maybe haven't embraced technology, they 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 have at this point in time. And that will be a, a step change for 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 them as well. No, I think I think that's that's absolutely right, Jeff. And there's there's pent up demand which has to be released at some point. Um, but we, we're still in lockdown, so let's not get too ahead of ourselves. Uh, the, the next question that we've got is um, for you, George. Um, do the portfolios look at tech companies that are doing well in lockdown? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, there's a number of ways in which we gain exposure to technology. I mean, I think one of the benefits of the TP portfolios is the breadth of sector exposure, which you do get there. So in terms of how we actually access technology, um, either on a, an index basis, so managers who are buying sort of index related products, such as the S&P 500 in the US, around 28% of that index is made up of technology names. You could buy a, a specific product, a specific fund, which has a, a tech exposure where you can buy individual stocks and shares. So managers such as Goldman Sachs with their income builder fund or Close Brothers will be buying individual holdings. So some of the best performing holdings for Close Brothers last year were names like, you know, Microsoft. You had Adobe in there as well, which, you know, Microsoft, who discussed the earnings, which came out there last week, the revenue reports just demonstrating the demand which you've had for tech there and how that's been beneficial for those specific names. I think, you know, to Chris's point, though, one observation that we have is how well technology has done um, through 2020 and, and year to date as well. Um, and the portfolios clients have been beneficiaries of that. What we like about our active managers is their ability to get ahead of the curve. So it was an interesting phrase there, companies which have done well. What we're also looking at is the next leg of markets. So, for example, if we look at technology, one of the positions which a manager such as 7IM increased at the back end of last year was their exposure to the emerging markets. And I think one of the reasons for that was because they were looking at hardware technology within Korea and Taiwan. So it's clear that the world's embraced technology a lot more, and it's going to be a greater part of people's lives as we move forward. So 
what they're doing there is gaining exposure to the people who build the infrastructure, the technology for really building into the next development um, as, as the global uh, trade cycle continues to, to strengthen, to obtain um, and, and getting ahead of that curve. So I think two sides, yes, we've been a beneficiary through index exposure, through direct exposure, but we're also getting ahead as well, looking at the future of technology and where, where that moves. I think it's worth bringing that out in the sense that when we we look at the article that we we put out last week around sort of the role of of semiconductors and the importance of semiconductors to to everything that we do, and we we think there about some of the the shifts in how that that technology has been been manufactured, and you know historically people have thought well that's that's a US dominated um, business well maybe it is from a, a design perspective but increasingly that's shifting to to Asia and to to emerging markets with you know the likes of TSMC Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing in Taiwan being the largest manufacturer globally of, of high-end chips we think about Samsung electronics which we we have exposure to as well being one of the the, the key beneficiaries of, of that trend as well and it feeds into everything. If you think about one of the bottlenecks to today in the in the global auto industry, it's you know we're seeing company after company. I think Ford just last night, you know, putting out a statement saying that that their manufacturing runs are being curtailed because they can't get the the semiconductors that they need, and it just speaks to the importance of technology and everything we do, but the, the components and and each incremental piece of that. So. The, it, it's not just, I suppose, what I'm trying to say. It's not just technology; it, it touches everything, and it yeah. enables so many other aspects of, of of what we do. And you maybe get a beneficiary through that through an equipment manufacturer, somebody that's manufacturing the equipment that makes semiconductors. You even get it through industrials because of the the, the specialised nature of of the buildings that's required to to manufacture semiconductors within so it the technology touches so many aspects and i think that's the that's the important point from the the portfolio's point of view that we you get various different ways of of accessing it and maybe one doesn't need to access it directly just touching on the, the point that that george is making around valuation but you can go to other areas to to, to look for similar exposure or similar themes yeah, and what, one of the, the beneficiaries of the lockdown or the stay-at-home um, forced culture that we had has been Netflix and their, their subscriber numbers. I know we talked about them a couple of weeks ago, but what was key for me is the fact that they're, they're generating more income now from subscribers, which meant that they don't have to go to the bond markets, to the debt market, to raise money for the production of their own um, programs. So they can They can do that out of their income now, which has a long-term effect on on Netflix profitability, and it, I thought that was significant. And also drops into how people value it as well. Yeah. So you you, you don't have a business that's requiring debt for growth, but it's it, it's self-funding its own growth. So there's a higher return on that, which over over the, the medium to longer term should provide that a difference between how people assess the the fundamental value of it and then ultimately what they're they're willing to pay for it in terms of the multiple attached. Yeah, sure, uh, Jeff. Um, a couple of people have written in and asked us about the UK market because we've, for, for well, for a couple of years really, it's been an unloved market, and it's also been a, a cheaper market when you look at other developed um, markets that are out there. Yeah. The question for you, and it's a tough one: Do you think the UK market will recover in 2021? I suppose if we if we if we take a step back and we think about some of the factors that have been really playing on on the UK and and why the UK has 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 lagged other markets you we can drop it into I think a couple of components there's there's the brexit uncertainty that was has clearly been there now that's that's dissipated um we would say with the the trade agreement that's in place albeit not services so there'll be a bit of a a kerfuffle around that and a back and forth as as we try and try and negotiate that but Overall, that takes that off the table. You've probably had the, the political backdrop in the UK as well, I think has been a bit a bit challenging. One would argue that, that that's off the table as well at this point in time. The point that I think Chris alluded to there that a, a few moments ago in terms of the performance differences at a sector level is, is really crucial when we think about the, the composition of the, the main index in the UK. And we think there about the, the preponderance really of oil and gas, 
chemicals and materials, those real industrial and you know, one could maybe even argue dirty industrial companies in, in there and, and also the exposure to financials, which just really hasn't been an area where the market has, has wanted to be at all um, over the recent past. But a number of those things have, have I suppose, started to, to change and alter. So p politics, bre Brexit off the table, we think about the importance of, of the EU as, a, as an export destination. Well, I think we, we think of it as a large export destination, it is, but it's not as large as it once was. So we go back to, to 2009 and say 60, 65 percent of our, our manufactured goods were exported to, to the EU. That's not the case today. It's 40 percent and continuing to come down. So that that's something that I think is, is sort of missed a little bit in, in some of the, the, the discussion. But you're, you're, you're right. The, the, the valuation has been a real anomaly. Um, particularly when we think about what's happened to to other global markets. So you, you think about the discount that the UK is on today, say if we look at on 2020 numbers, probably trading on, on 20 times versus closer to 30 times for, for the US. So a, a material discount there. Now, some of that could be justified given the low earnings that we're seeing coming through from the likes of the energy companies. But then if we look forward, one would be expecting that earnings growth profile to pick up, which should support um, valuations. I think the other interesting fact from my perspective around the UK is what happened last year in terms of the, the sort of the reset of dividends and the, the very significant dividend reductions that we, we saw coming through from, from UK companies. That has, I think, cleared out Maybe I we could argue some companies were were over distributing, i.e., paying out more than they should have been paying, but felt obliged to keep that going, to to support the share price. That's gone now, but crucially, the yield in the UK market three and a half percent from a, from a dividend perspective. So you compare that to the bond market; it's quite an interesting pickup in terms of of, of yield and income that that an investor can pick up by being in in the UK market. I think the other thing that's that's very evident when when we take a look at sort of the sector level and even down to a company level, you just look at some of the, the some of the great companies in the FTSE 100 and the valuation that they've got relative to their global peers. Um, there's material discounts there, so there is opportunity, an opportunity for um, investors, opportunity for other companies to come in and have a look. So M and A opportunities to use higher rated. Uh, valuations from other markets to come in and, and buy UK assets. Now, I suppose the, the quid pro quo in that is, is, is that a good thing? Well, it's good in the in the first instance if it comes in and it offers a premium, uh, but it removes a good company from the UK. And the, it swings and roundabouts whether the longer term that's actually a good thing, but clearly we are seeing M&A pick up. And you know we just look at what's happened over the course of the past few months, we've seen RSA, we've seen in the in sort of the leisure area, MT and William Hill, we've seen a, a bid battle for, for G4S. Um, so there, there is, I think, signs that the, the dynamics are picking picking up. It's becoming more more interesting for people to look at. And it goes back to, I suppose, again, thinking about the currency. Probably would argue that a floor has been really put below the currency at this point in time, and that will give people a, another degree of confidence from which to to look at uh, sterling assets. And it it goes back to something George was mentioning right at the at the beginning in terms of just if we look at what the Bank of England were saying yesterday and the rollout of the vaccines. Yes, they've downgraded economic growth a little bit, but it is a a positive and an improving uh, picture. And in a relative sense that relative improvement is from a low base and it's also should be better than we see in the in the likes of of Europe at this point in time given the the, the speed of of the UK vaccine rollout so i think there's a number of supportive factors um for for UK assets in in, in that regard yeah and the, the the very construct of the portfolio has been on a multi asset basis means that we can have exposure to the UK, but also not just the headline UK as in the, the FTSE 100. We get into the, the 250, as you mentioned before, smaller cap and into the, the all share as well, so that the, the portfolios are positioned to benefit from that. Um, headlines over the last few weeks have been dominated by GameStop. 
um, and the 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 short squeeze that we've we've seen there. And um, the question that that came in was, and it's an interesting one. Do you think that it was right that a number of trading platforms stopped retail investors investing in GameStop? And if so, why? And I think it, before we answer the question, we need to look at exactly what happened there and and what what is a short squeeze. Um, Chris, do you want to take that on the, the shorting of stock to begin with? Yeah, sure. So um, maybe just taking a step back from it, you know, GameStop is a company that has a group of shops in the US and Europe. Those shops sell either new computer games or secondhand computer games. And the reality is, is GameStop, basically those shops have been closed for quite a bit of 2020 for the obvious reason of, of COVID. So, and also when you think about that as well, you've got to think, well, who would be the people that would be most computer savvy to buy their computer games off the internet? People who are into computer games. So so let's just take that as the starting point, okay? So when, when, when you sort of take a step back from that and you think, um, what's happened? So basically hedge funds have looked at that and they've decided to what we call short GameStop shares. So what that means is they borrow shares in the market and then what they're doing is they're betting that those shares will fall and then what they're doing is is they sell the shares in the market and then they buy them back at a lower price. Okay. Now obviously that's if that works in the way that they'd like it to work, i.e. the share price goes down, then then they make a lot of money. That's what exactly what they're trying to do. But on the other side of that is what happens when the share price starts to rise. So obviously that's then causing the hedge fund a loss. And that's what you saw with GameStop. So firstly, you'll probably wear it. You know, you'll accept the pain. You'll accept some losses. But then at some point, you've then got to start buying those shares. So you've got to start to reduce the size of your position because you'll be coming up to your risk limits overall. Now, obviously, stock market, it's a function of supply and demand. So if you start buying the shares, then it starts pushing that share price up again. If you start to get a group of people that are seeing that, they start buying the shares, they start pushing up the share price even more you have to start to buy those shares as well. And that, that's what you call a short squeeze. So um, what you've seen in GameStop is, you know, you've all seen the headlines, you know, incredible share price performance. Um, but actually what you've seen over the last week is, is GameStop, the share price come right down. So last Friday, you were looking at a share price of around about $348. Today, you're looking at a share price of just over $50 per share. So you've seen that share price come down significantly. Um, obviously, the big thing is, you know, retail investors are the champions. Um, you know, those kind of nasty hedge funds, they've, they've lost out. But I think the reality is, is when you look at the losses, I think the figure that I've seen, I've seen a lot of different figures here is around about $5 billion to the hedge funds. So it's not such a huge figure. If you compare that to what's happened in the past with short squeeze, so if you look at, say, what happened with Volkswagen shares in 2008, you know, the loss there was $35 billion. So it was much more significant. Now, obviously, what's happened is this has kind of caught the headlines. It's caught individuals' interest. Um, but the reality is, is what you've just seen is speculation on the share price. I think, though, to answer the question is is much more difficult in the sense that, um, is it sort of fair that the platforms stop trading? Um, that's a really difficult question to answer, but in some ways the platforms had to because they have to post margin cost on the other side of it. So they needed to get more funding in overall. Um, but, you know, should people be allowed to trade in that? I think it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, but the reality is, is you're trading completely on speculation. And that's the thing that's really dangerous. You know, there's no fundamentals behind this. It's just pure speculation overall. Yeah, I think it's an interesting one, isn't it? When you think it should people, 
should the platform stop people buying? Well, there's two sides to it. There's, should, is it a restriction of, of, of freedom to be able to, not to be able to buy that's this the stock? Thing, yeah. So that, that's a much wider argument. In practice, what, what it probably did was stop people buying at those elevated levels and and avoided the losses that they would have had if they'd bought as the the stock was on its way up. And I think you know it's in a ridiculous situation where at one stage there was over I think it was about 140 percent of the value, the overall value of the company was being shorted. So you, you've got an extreme situation coming. And I know you know when you when you look at, at other examples of trading that's been restricted we've had circuit breakers uh, last year during the the worst of the volatility both on the downside and the upside so that that has happened in the market and now in the you know in the UK we still have people who can't access property funds because they've been gated and i think it's when you want to get out of something that's to me it seems like a worse restriction than stopping you buying it um but that, that that's my personal view anyway i think it's also i think you know there's, there's there's two sides of it if if the if a platform and you know the the, the one in the us that, that stop people trading is is doing it for a reason that it's not making public is is probably something that that needs to be to be dealt with in a slightly different way I think going back to just if we think about the, the comments of we made around central bankers and the importance of communication, it's about communicating to to clients as potentially why you're having to stop it. And I suppose one of the, the challenges that was faced there is that the reality being that um, they were having to post very significant margin calls and had to raise capital. And if we look at what one firm had to raise, it had to raise three point four billion dollars. Of, of additional collateral and that is I suppose at one level we're saying that the system is functioning well because it's seeing that there's volatility within a particular asset and it's requiring anybody any any market participant not just that platform to to post additional collateral against it and if you think about how that works um, say say that say that stock was trading at, at ten bucks and you're short it by a million shares, so you're 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 short ten million. You you need to post collateral um, of one hundred and twelve percent against that. So on that trade, it's not not that del you your delta is twelve and a half million of of collateral. But if you see that price move up to say three hundred three hundred and twenty five three hundred and fifty dollars, and you apply that same methodology staying just short that same amount your collateral requirement is now in north of 400 million dollars so the regulatory requirement is is working because it's it's less safe i.e for that institution to be involved so there's risk that, that needs to be mitigated and risk that needs to be mitigated within the system and and that's probably where there's been you know poor sort of communication around the the backdrop of why you may have to to reduce the ability of people to to trade in certain stocks at certain points in time to to deal with the the plumbing if you will the thing that none of us really talk about but that the plumbing that allows the us to go on buy something and sell it there's there's an awful lot of work goes on in the background between the clearing houses depositories etc that, that allow the market to function effectively and that's what the SEC, that's the lens they'll be looking at it through, you know, their principles to, you know, protect investors and to maintain fair and orderly financial markets. And it's, it's exactly to that point, Jeff, it's looking at the plumbing and making sure that, you know, the market is operating efficiently, it is operating fair, and it is operating in the interest of investors. But, you know, exactly to your point also, Mark, I think it just gave investors a chance to, to and, and rationalise what they were seeing um, and, and the movements which they were seeing could... Were they rational <laughs> in effect? Yeah, um, we've got time for one more question, and it, it it'll. I'm interested to hear everybody's views on this because it concerns cryptocurrency. Um, the question was basically, what are what are our thoughts on cryptocurrency? Um, George, you can begin on with this one. I've got a lot of friends who've all of a sudden become experts on cryptocurrencies over the last few few weeks months and years um, and I always ask them to 
to explain, you know, again, come back to, can you rationalize it? If you invest in something, do you understand it? Can you rationalize what's driving the valuation? Can you rationalize what's driving the volatility? And they find it very difficult. And I think that's not just my friends in, in, in my WhatsApp group chat. I think that's a theme for, for many people trying to understand exactly what is driving the valuation and also, you know, why we see these such sudden spikes in volatility. And a lot of it comes down to trends. A lot of it comes down to, um, you know, forums and, and signals in that way. But um, it, it's very difficult to to value in, 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 in that sense. That's that's my opinion. I think for me, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of interest in it because you've seen quite significant price appreciation. Um, but I think George is completely right. You know, what is the intrinsic value of a single Bitcoin? I was thinking about this this morning. I remember when I was I was younger, kind of you know, like five, six, seven. And once a year, there used to be the horse race, the Grand National. And my dad used to take me into the betting shop and it always used to smell of smoke and kind of stale lager. It's something that I remember very well. But we always used to look at the paper and you basically just pick out something with a name that you liked. And with Bitcoin, I really struggle to see how you value it. I struggle to see really what its its use in normal society is. Um, what you've seen with the FCA, you know, they're very, very cautious now around Bitcoin. Bitcoin investments aren't covered by the financial services compensation scheme. You know, if you lose money on Bitcoin or if you have a problem with a Bitcoin provider, you can't go to the ombudsman. Um, you've got to think, would I want my pension to be invested in Bitcoin? You know, you talk about things going up by 10 percent in a day. You know, it goes down by 10 percent. It goes down by more than 10 percent in a day. And it's just you've got something that's exceptionally volatile. You've got something arguably that's very difficult to store. You've got something that is difficult to value. And for me, you know, fair enough. Some people are making a, a lot of money on it. There seems to be a lot of influencers out in Dubai who seem to be posting cryptocurrency accounts on their Instagram accounts. Um, but the reality is, is that for me, you know, it's too volatile. You can't value it. Um, and, you know, it's not held within the true potential portfolio proposition. Let me just add a, a couple of things that I sort of I'm, I'm thinking about as to what is what really is Bitcoin and what's its what, what, yeah. what are the roles of these things? Are they if you think about money and how you use it, it's about transferring of, 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 of value and there is a, an underlying value to it allegedly, but one could you want to be at that as well, um, given you know, it, it's based on fiat currency effectively. So we would, you know, you can debate that. But or, or is Bitcoin just a method of exchange um, that facilitates exchange without it being something being able to tra be tracked? So it can't be tracked. You, you don't really, you don't really know. So that, that that's sort of something that's in 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 the in the back of my mind around it. The other thing that you know, I think a lot of people don't appreciate is is how Bitcoins are created and how they're mined effectively from computing systems. So it's a really interesting one that, that people want to discuss Bitcoin, think about its role. But at the same time, if you look at it through a, a sustainability lens, um, it's probably one of the most highest uses of energy to mine Bitcoins um, that, that, that there is out there. So there's this real contrast between um, how people think about it and how they think about broader themes as well that Bitcoin maybe removes you from one societal issue, i.e. of being tracked about what you're doing, but actually it's exceptionally bad for a number of other factors in terms of the, the energy required to, to mine a single Bitcoin. I think, Jeff, that, that brings me on to something that I was reading just uh, earlier in the week about the, the energy usage, because they say that Bitcoin uses an estimated energy consumption, which is the, the same as Switzerland. It has a carbon footprint the same as New Zealand, and you know in Iceland the the, the domestic usage of, of energy is less than than cryptocurrency. So it's it, it's it's really a, a a very very interesting area to look at. You know, single a single Bitcoin transaction. I'll I'll bore you with this one for the last time. It's the equivalent of seven hundred twenty three thousand Visa transactions. Or 
55,000 hours of watching you on YouTube. You know, so it, it's, it's, it does burn energy. And the other one I noticed was this, that poor gentleman in, I think it was Newport, you know, put his hard drive in the bin in 2013. And there was seven, seven and a half thousand Bitcoin locked on that hard drive, which is now worth 200 million quid. So you can understand why he's frantically trying to get the, the council to allow him to, to reopen the landfill. And I think his latest attempt is he's offered them 25 percent of the, the value. Should he recover that, um, that, that one hard drive <laughs> somewhere that's buried in, in a, a rubbish tip in Newport? Um, but there's also a, a, a guy in San Francisco who forgot his password. He cannot get into his folder. He's got $267 million in there, but he can't access it. So um, those are the stories that I read about Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency uh, just last week. Um, I think that that's probably all we've got time for um, on, on the Q&A. Gentlemen, thank you for joining everybody this morning. Um, just before we go, I'd like to highlight a um, uh, uh, an activity that's been carried out by Greg Lang, one of the senior management team here at, at True Potential. Uh, Greg decided that he would like to, to do some good during lockdown for himself, but more importantly for, for others. And he's, um, he's, he's raising money for cash for kids. And what Greg's decided to do is run the same distance as it is between Land's End and John O'Groves by running every day. And he started it a couple of weeks ago and he's 90 90 miles into a 1,082 mile journey. So he runs every day and so far he's raised 770 pounds for cash for kids. So if you'd like to follow Greg's journey, it's on TPL, tplp.com backslash Greg and that's double G for Greg. Um, he's got as far as Tavistock so far virtually anyway and I think Jenny hopes he stays in Tavistock. <laughs> but we'll, we'll keep... We'll keep monitoring Greg's progress as he runs runs um, from from uh, Land's End to John O'Groats. And of course, Greg's doing it the hard way. He's going uphill, but he's used to running uphill anyway. So that's <laughs> that's that's his his choice. Um, I think that's all from us, folks, for this week. Um, we're a week closer to the end of lockdown. A week closer to enjoying weekends outdoors. Um, but please. Join us again next week. Thanks for your time this morning, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to the True Potential YouTube channel. If you have any questions or requests for future videos, let us know in the comments.